When the book Passion and Revolution by Reynaldo Clemenia Ileto came out in 1979, it created quite a stir in the academic world among historians and social scientists here in the Philippines and abroad. Benedict Anderson, a renowned scholar, wrote that it was unquestionably the most profound and searching book on late 19th century Philippine history. Many other scholars wrote about the groundbreaking work. What Ray did was to go into popular literature, particularly using the Passion as, an, uh, as a source of materials to reconstruct the past. And in that sense, it was a very pioneering work at that time. Ray also advocated what he calls a history from below, whereas historians up to that point in the 1970s usually focused on the big men as the movers and shakers of history. What Ray did was to focus on ordinary peasants, ordinary people as the main actors of uh, that changed history. What he did was to focus on ordinary peasant movements and elevated them to the level of major forces in history. So what Ray has done was really trailblazing and what he has done is open up the field of, of the study of the past for Filipinos and to make the study of the past more interesting. This is not to deny the utility and importance of archival sources, but his work opened the possibility of actually looking at other sources to reconstruct the past. But what's important about his work is that even scholars not working on the Philippines began to take notice of the Philippines because of Passion and Revolution. So there are scholars who are specializing on other parts of the world that for the first time bothered to read about the Philippines and the only book that they have in fact read would be Passion and Revolution. The book was a significant achievement for the young historian who did not really intend to be one when he entered the Ateneo University. I, I was really gearing up to be an engineer. That's why my degree at the Ateneo was pre-engineering. I wanted to be an electronics engineer. But uh, in 1965, my, my grandmother took me to, to Japan on a holiday and when, after I got back, I, I, I got very restless and I didn't feel like doing those advanced in engineering and math subjects anymore. So I shifted from pre-engineering to the humanities. Upon graduation, he applied to do graduate studies in Southeast Asian studies and was accepted by Cornell University as a student in Southeast Asian history. He had to think about it because he did not particularly like history at that time, but he did not want to pass up the chance to study further in the United States. In Cornell, he was trained by his mentors, which included the famed Oliver Walters, to be an area specialist grounded in history, cultural anthropology, and literary criticism. The interdisciplinary approach not only suited Ileto's broad range of interests and abilities, it also showed him a more creative and unconventional way to study and write history. The more important thing is to write, a, to write history in, in a way that, that is interesting and that um, transforms uh, people's consciousness. I would say that the most important thing is to write the history of the present. To not, to not write history as a dead past, you know, about things that happened. It's about how we can understand what's happening now by going back uh, to the past, by looking at the genealogy of the things we see around us, or the, the politics of the times, because we can understand them better if we, uh, if we look at how they came to be uh, in terms of a certain historical development. Dr. Ileto believes in writing history for the people and in making history meaningful for us Filipinos because he believes in the importance of having a sense of national history. And the challenge now is that we, 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 cannot, we cannot anymore adhere to a single narrative. That's a problem. You know? There cannot be a Philippine history that will satisfy everyone. So Philippine history has to be presented in such a way that, uh, that it encapsulates tension and, and controversy and, and actually the, uh, the, the battle between different perspectives, different ideologies. That is what our national history can be. We should not leave behind the, the work that has been done by our predecessors on the, the, the Philippine Revolution. You know, the, the, 
The moorings of our nation state lie in the late 19th century, the time of Rizal leading to the Katipunan Revolution, the Malolos Republic, the Filipino-American War. Those are the, those are the basic, that's the groundwork of our national history and we, shouldn't, uh, we, we should continue to pursue those topics. But if you're asking me how history can, can be used to solve our present problems, then, then we have to still continue to um, kind of mobilize history for nation building. But I think that a, go a good way of, uh, of continuing to do this is to, is to build on the notion of the unfinished revolution. I think that's a very important trope that our revolution did happen, we had a, a national revolution, but it's unfinished. And so in what ways is, uh, is it unfinished? And then we can apply that notion of unfinished revolution to specific problems we have in the present, but I won't specify those particular ones. But if we have, if we can internalize this, this, this notion of unfinished revolution, then uh, history you know, uh, becomes alive for every generation because not, as, not any particular generation can finish it. It's always kind of being pushed forward, this notion of unfinishedness.